What's up, retro gamers? You're listening to Game Overcast, episode two. Today, we're going to be talking about the Xeno franchise. Robots! Pokemon, VeggieTales, plus a brief history of Monolith Soft. I'm really feeling it! <laughs> you want, want me to Q, give you a Q, little backslash there? Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm really feeling it. What's another line from the... I'm game? really feeling it! The, oh, God. I'm really well, feeling well, the it! the new one, it, it, it's like, God, I, I've actually kind of forcibly repressed it now. <laughs> Yo, guys, what does he say? What is his friend? Ryan, he's like, you're happy I'm here? No one? All right. <laughs> I love... He actually acknowledges that they're they're not happy he's there. Yeah. <laughs> I love Doug, because whenever Doug, this whenever you win with Doug, he, he's like, boom, and just walks away. <laughs> like, okay. Job, Welcome to Game Overcast. My name is Dan. That is Matt. Howdy, still here somehow. That is Michael. Hello. Michael is he, our guest again. I, I'm a regular still. He's st- We're I'm working still on a regular. Yeah. Hopefully he stays regular. Therapy is taking effect, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, welcome back. Um, thanks for listening to our awesome, amazing retro podcast where we talk about all things retro, but usually just one franchise at a time. Because if we talked about everything, it would take forever. The right? madness that would ensue. It'd be, cra- it'd be a 26 million hour podcast. Nobody wants to listen to that. Well. Especially if Matt's on it. Hey, hey, I have a <laughs> hey, lovely his voice. voice. Is, yeah, his voice is soothing. Yeah, he literally has the only good radio voice. Soothing voice. It's now, true. Now I'm all creeped out. <laughs> I can try to do it. Let's jump into now playing before I lose my nerves. So, <laughs> first of all, I want to acknowledge that we did not say something extremely important in the last episode, and that was that 2016 is Sonic's 25th anniversary. Woo! So, happy anniversary. Sorry we missed it by a month, I guess. We, hey. Make some good games. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. We miss you, Sonic. Come back. We love you. Have you ever noticed that when Sonic, he kind of lost weight and he looked better and felt better himself and he started making really bad games right about at that transition point? Maybe. See, that's the thing. Once People you... have a, well, everybody has a low period, you know? He just needs his friends. Just the past 20 years or so, you know, he'll, he'll bounce back. Him. <laughs> yeah, he'll bounce back. He'll be okay. All right. Um, also, check it out. I, I looked this up and... As far as VeggieTales video games are concerned, if you did listen to our last oh, podcast, no. there was a whole conversation about whether they made VeggieTales video games. They made tons of PC games. Like, of course. Over 30 different free PC games. Was it like point and click adventure? I don't know. They were all different. And they also did make um, a game called VeggieTales Larry Boy and the Bad Apple. Um, which is available on the Game Boy Advance and the PlayStation 2. I'm going to find that. Um, and we talked about how we thought that VeggieTales would make a good Wii game because everything came out on the Wii. You can throw vegetables. There's locks. <laughs> yeah. There's no official VeggieTales video game for the Wii, but there is a game called Veggie World, spelled V-E-G-G-Y. It's actually a bootleg it's VeggieTales a game. Yeah. It, it's, it's basically a minigame collection because every single game on the Wii was a minigame collection. Yeah. Um, but I want to try to find one and play it and give you guys a short review next time that'll I'm be my now playing next time so looking forward to yeah. it you know some of those pc games like there was a lot of like uh young age pc games that were actually pretty cool like yeah. they weren't gripping you know, had like decent stories and they were all point and click with like original Barbie animation stuff and everything. Really darn cool. right buddy darn right it's my favorite i've got the special edition framed on my wall I, I actually wouldn't punch it whenever I go to work in the morning. Right. <laughs> it's popular. Start my day right. Uh, I also want to mention, um, I want to thank a listener. His name is Eric with Cheese Ashley. He's a YouTube uh, YouTube subscriber. He says, great listen. Looking forward to future episodes. Glad someone mentioned the Knuckles Chaotix game, which was not on the Gems Collection. Unfortunately. I think we talked about that a little bit. Yeah, we wanted to see if it was or not. Um, and I actually did a little bit of research and found that uh, Knuckles Chaotix used to be on GameTap. Remember Game Tap? Oh, wow. Yeah, vaguely. it was a website where you could basically play retro games on online or you could download them. Um, and it's not around anymore, which is weird because now that's like what everybody does. But yeah, that was... It was there. like before it should have been. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. way ahead of its time. You know what I mean? And so as of right now, as far as we know, the only way to play Knuckles Chaotix is to go to Game Over Video Games, purchase a Sega Genesis and a 32X and a copy of the game. Sega. And, Sega, and then you make your Sega power tower, t- tower, of power, power, power turns into yeah. a star destroyer. Man. Knuckles chaotic on the top. With Knuckles chaotic on the top. Chaotic was awesome, man. It's totally worth it. So great. You should definitely play. Um, Matt, you were right 
You made a prediction. I was. I was. We need to write that down. Seriously. For once in my life. Oh yeah, that was so true. He was right about Bayonetta being in Smash Brothers, and uh, you were you, Matt, my, Michael, must be. I'm really excited just, about it. Yeah. Like that whole time, like the whole stream, I was like, I can't believe it. You, well, you guys, were I was texting you both, like, oh my god. So I'm gonna have. I'm gonna confess something. When. When Kid Icarus was on the screen and he was looking up at the sky and he was our pit, whatever, sorry, was up at the sky and he was like looking, I, I 100% like anticipated seeing Banjo flying in with <laughs> yeah, you told me that on his back <laughs> and I was I mean, like freaking out because I swear I could like see it in my brain happening and then it was Bayonetta. I felt dumb because I didn't make the connection because it was like a little drawn out in the beginning with him like setting it up and I didn't even make the angel connection and, no, I, had ju- no. and I had just been playing Bayonetta and that's like all you do is kill angels <laughs> and I'm just like, I was like oh, I'm yeah. glad because I was already so down because I was texting down I was like really another Fire Emblem character I mean don't get me wrong he looks really cool <laughs> that was like, that like, yeah, we need another sword yeah. thank goodness yeah no because remember we talked to, and then pretty much it was like that doesn't make sense like why but it apparently does yeah. I okay. also want to say that I love Cloud in Smash he's my new favorite character I destroy with him I I'm love the limit that. break mechanic it's amazing I haven't downloaded him yet dude he's I, so good I actually have to plug my Wii U back in but I, I me and my friends play Smash like every weekend which we just go crazy with it so I have to download every character or they'll get mad at me uh, i got cool. in trouble i am um, i only only one of my friends will play smash with me now because mm-hmm. everyone else i beat the living heck out of them so they just they don't like me whenever i bring up smash they throw rocks at me and tell me to go back inside <laughs> so i don't play that much anymore why are you nice. talking to random people on the street like, about hey, smash? Smash? Smash are right. you right <laughs> so uh, i have a question for you guys what retro game do you want to see a digital release for in 2016 that isn't on, either on virtual console or you know a game tap whatever mischief makers done that was fast finished um wh- whenever anyone brings up is there a retro game that you like that is your favorite or that you would like to see remade it would be mischief makers um that was originally for the nintendo 64 mm-hmm. yeah. easily probably one of my top five favorite games ever um was that on the wii virtual console i don't i don't think so I'm, I, I might be mistaken on that one but i don't remember it being released it's i don't think so. it was pretty pretty obscure even for its time because when the game came out um if you all haven't played mischief makers yet which i'm sure half of you probably haven't um it's this really really awesome platformer for the 64 that was made by treasure which is one of my favorite game studios of all time they made gunstar heroes and um light crusader and the good mcdonald's game for the genesis and um all kinds of other cool stuff but they're amazing mm-hmm. One of the one of the I don't know some of the drawbacks, but one of the limitations as far as the sales of that game went is you played as a girl. And back in the '90s, and even sometimes now, if you're a little boy, you're like, "Well, I don't want to play as a girl." And even me, my parents bought it for me. I was like, "Wait a minute, you're a girl, mom? I don't want it." And then I played it, and two days later, I woke up and realized, "Wow, this is the best game ever." I have nothing but good things to say about Mischief Makers. It, I look it up, and unfortunately, it was never released on any virtual console. The only way to buy it is at Game Over Video Games. <laughs> Or you know, when we, yeah, when you see it, it's hard to come by, but it's not super expensive and it's, it's super not, good. Yeah, because it's, it's really underrated, and and most people don't even know what it is. But if you're if you're a platforming fan, if you're a fan of uh, Treasure, um, the development uh, studio, uh, or if you just want our cool game for the N64, totally check it out. It's awesome, super game. quirky and epic. I mean, I mean, you think about it, it, it plays like a Mario game where you're an android, where the primary mechanic is grabbing things, shake, shake. yeah, friends and foes, and shaking the crap out of them and throwing them, throwing them around. It's like, yay! <laughs> Love it, and the faces, man. The faces always creep me All out, but it's such a cool little. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, Michael. What what retro game do you want to see a digital release for in twenty sixteen? Uh, I have got most of like my favorites got remade, but well, aren't um, you lucky? I am. No, um, I I've been a few years ago. It's a Tomb Raider, but I got to. I like the new the one. original Tomb Raider. Well, yeah, I like that they revamped it. Because, well, no, I'm talking about. You mean like uh, like Virtual Console? Oh, Virtual like Console. A, just a straight up oh. digital release of, of the old game. Yeah, I get pretty much everything I want. I'm lucky. Like I, like all the RPGs. I can't help it. Whatever. They come through. Boring. It is boring, but it's wonderful. Okay. Hate you. I think if I were to choose one game this year that uh, has never gotten digital release. Man. See, it's hard. It's a hard question. About, well, yeah, I should have thought about this before. I, I'm going to say... Um, I'm going to say there are a ton of games for the Super Nintendo that just will never see the light of day, unfortunately. Trolls um, Adventure. I mean, so the original Pocky and Rocky, I don't think is on anything. I know we just got uh, one of the one of them, but I don't think Pocky and Rocky. Um, Pocky and Rocky is interesting because it's like this top-down 
multi-directional shooter, but you play a kid and a squirrel. Like, you're, you're a shrine maiden, yeah, Dan. Yeah, whatever. Okay. And it's multiplayer. And it's, it's, and it's a nuki. It's two-player co-op. <laughs> yes, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I was a kid, and it was a kid and a squirrel, so <laughs> yeah. deal with it. Um, it's a, Yeah, it's an amazing multi-directional shooter, like, uh, akin to modern-day things like um, Galaxy... Uh, Galaxy... No. It's like Raiden, almost. It's like a top-down yeah. shooter, but you're on foot. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it's it's so fun. I mean, you get power-ups, and, and it's the kind of thing where, like... Um, I love this mechanic in shooters where if you get hit, you don't die. You just lose a power-up, you know? And so it just becomes harder and harder. But, um, yeah, it looks really cheesy, but if you can find a copy of that on the Super Nintendo, I highly recommend it. I'd love to see it on the Virtual Console or something. Um, yeah, super fun. Yeah, they don't support the virtual console enough. I think it's kind of like with Mission Makers, where it's almost a licensing issue. Yeah, I mean, that's there. what it seems to be. Which is a shame. I think Pocky and Rocky with Becky is the one that just got put on, on the virtual console. Who the hell is Becky? I don't know. But yeah, it hasn't come out for anything. Uh, I've played the second one a little bit, but the first one's really the one I'm talking about that. Okay. Really well, I know two is good. Two is just where one's kind of hard to find. Two is just... Like yeah. what's the, I didn't even know it existed until about a year or two ago. That's, it's super hard to find. That's probably why the first one is the one that I've mm. played. One. Okay, so Pocket and Rocky with Becky came out on the Game Boy Advance. Oh, okay. Um, oh, oh yeah, and it did come out on the Wii U Virtual Console recently. So maybe I'll go check that out. Cool. Yeah. There you go. That's hey, that's a, a happy ending to my story. <laughs> I'm kind of like Michael now. Everything that I want. I'll just be alone everything in the I want. I get with my giant robots <laughs> and my uh, mischief makers. <laughs> <laughs> you jerks. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> All right, let's jump into some news. Check this out. Do you guys are you guys familiar with a little console by the name of the ColecoVision? No. Nah. Well, I'm okay. Well, fine. Wasn't it like this thing they had back in the '80s? That yeah. Like... It's like <laughs> no, yeah, it was a great console, um, akin to Atari uh, and television. Better I than think the Atari, Coleco actually. Had way also, better graphics than than most of the stuff mm -hmm. out at the time, but it was just really expensive, so nobody bought it. Um, Could play Atari games also if you had the adapter, which is pretty sweet. That's mm -hmm. incredible. Uh, now nowadays, that would be like, oh wow, I can plug in a thing to my Xbox One and play PS4 games. Like, nope, that's illegal. Day before wonderful copyright yeah. laws and stuff. <laughs> Um, so, uh, our, the owner of the company, David Kalin actually commented on this story when we were, um, when we were talking about it, he said, uh, well, let me tell you guys the news first. Um, Coleco, the company behind the moderately successful eighties game console, ColecoVision is back with designs for a new console. The console will reportedly take cartridges and play licensed retro games, as well as some first party indie games in the eight, 16 and 32 bit Style. So is this going to be like a Retron 5 again, pretty much? No, it's saying? playing or? new games. Oh, so, so new for instance, stuff. let's say, from what I heard, let's say you can buy a cartridge of Shovel Knight mm -hmm. um, and plug it into your your games. Yeah, it, that's kind of cool. From what I read, it, that's what it sounded like. It's 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 like respecting the, the so, classic. So the we setup. have the possibility of new. It will be new, games. new cartridges. The system, and, and, and new indie games like what he mentioned. The system will not feature internet connectivity. The console looks like an Atari Jaguar. with, And the controller looks like the Wii U Pro controller. Didn't they actually use Atari shells for it? I heard that. I don't yeah, think it was so, or not. But. A, a while back, a company called Retro Video Game Systems, which, okay, that's their, that's your name. Good name. <laughs> <laughs> they knew what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. They had a failed Indiegogo campaign to create a similar console using the shells of undistributed Atari Jaguar hardware. Um, the company is now working with Coleco to see the Coleco Chameleon come to life. That's so cool. it's called yeah. the Chameleon, is what yeah. we're calling it. Yeah, Coleco Chameleon. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Um, I can't do it. It's going to have its own, Lico, 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 own proprietary cartridges. Uh, so David Kalin says, um, the guy who started slash owns GameGavel.com, an online eBay-type website for games, also started Retro Magazine. Uh, from there, the Retro Video Game Systems was born, so he's, I guess he started the company, um, as they bought the original molds for the Atari Jaguar plastic shells. Basically, with that, they plan to make an all-new cartridge-based system to run homebrew carts housed in the Atari Jaguar shells. Now, I guess they're working with Coleco uh, to try to keep the project alive, but time will tell what happens there. I wish them lots of luck, and if it succeeds, we'd love to have the new cartridge systems added to the mix. That was David Kalin's... Um, Two cents, the owner of Game Over Media. What games. a two cents it and was. That was your moment with David. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up next week. Yeah, the <laughs> Mr. Well, the podcast. Thanks, guys. <laughs> this um, this sounds really really amazing. I'd love to have a new cartridge based system, but 
Captain Cynical wants to pop up here and say that I don't think it's going to do very well, though. I, I can imagine it gonna, it's going to come out, and you're going to have some maybe some stuff like Shovel Knight, and you're going to have some homebrew, and then you're going to have lots of other maybe pirated stuff on it, which is fine and all, but it's just that's just not my cup of tea. I'd like to have actually a lot of new indie developers make like new yeah. games. I mean, if that happens, I would, I would love feel it. like I'll if it gets embraced, I think it would be really cool because I mean that's. that's used video game market is all these cartridges and people love that mm-hmm. whole aesthetic you know and having it there with you to physically touch it I feel like it'd be nice to have a little just small return to that it. it'd be awesome for collectors yeah. I just wonder if there's enough of a market out there for that's it. my concern yeah because you will buy it you know we're going to get it and we're going to play it and we're going to love it but um, I don't know if there's a big enough market to make it a general use thing for developers to actually start making cartridges now. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a pretty unique thing, but hopefully I'm all, all, all the yeah. best. Hopefully it'll work out great. I hope yeah, so. Yeah, I, I was not a backer on the Indiegogo, but if, if they do another, because I didn't hear about it, but if they do another um, crowdfunding campaign, I'd totally be down for that. I mean, it looks cool. I'm, I'm down for it. Take uh, it. Cool. So moving on. Gunscape, 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 the uh, multiplayer shooter meets Minecraft game, is going to have a release on multiple consoles. Oh, so, no. Uh, <laughs> you, have you heard that? I haven't, no. No, but you, you said shooter in Minecraft. I know, I'm, now I'm like, so, 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 yeah, my first inclination of this game was like, how, what, tell, what are you talking about? Right now, you can actually pick it up on Microsoft Windows and Xbox One. Um, it looks like GoldenEye. Like, if you look at the game, it looks like GoldenEye, which is why we're talking about a retro chat. Is it less blurry? It's basically like a GoldenEye fan's um, happy time. You know, whatever. Yeah, it's a good. It's a yeah. If you're a GoldenEye fan, you would love this. So um, it has online multiplayer creation mode, which means that multiple people can be on the same level making it in Minecraft style with blocks. Uh, you can create your own story in branching levels, so you can create multiple levels and have a story in an area. Go That's cool. levels. Yeah, eight player split screen on the same console. That makes my brain hurt. That makes my tiny <laughs> screens, everybody. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, hurt. I've seen videos of it, and basically it's like split into right. nine, right. and the center is like a map, and then there's eight screens around. And you're all crowding it, around the line. Can you imagine the screen picking on that? It's like, I can see all of you. If you're familiar with Wolfenstein 3D uh, on, I think it was on Mac. I played it on Mac back in the day. They had a level creation mode that was very similar to this but there weren't there weren't levels it was basically just one flat plane with walls you could build you could build maps you could build mazes you could put enemies and keys and I used to spend so much time on that that I mean I would spend more time making levels than playing them uh, this is right up my alley I'm gonna play the crap out of this when it comes out on Wii U that sounds awesome. Yeah. It, and it was, it was stuff like uh, Wolfenstein and Doom that were the birth of the modding community because you had stuff like – and even stuff back then before they had, once again, those laws against it, they would sell these collections of them. We've had them turned into the stores sometimes where people are like, yeah, it's this big giant PC box where it's like Doom Hardcore Edition and it's a bunch of unlicensed, super hard Doom levels and stuff. That was really, really cool and that was the genesis that, of a lot yeah. of stuff. Yeah. yeah, I love playing those like old – and you can there's a website where you can play all that mm-hmm. stuff now. But. That's where you get stuff like Mario Maker now on Little mm-hmm. Big Planet and thing and yeah. we're shifting a lot more into this uh, player driven creativity now which is really cool for gaming I think yeah the hard part now is big data where you have to curate the, the good levels mm-hmm. and get people to play your levels kind of like a YouTube mentality where like now there's tons and tons of content out, out there like to, to use Mario Maker as an example there's what they said there's like 10 million Mario Maker levels out there now but finding the good stuff suck, is really probably, hard. Yeah. and YouTube's really done a good job of like curating that and so have services like uh, like Minecraft and mm-hmm. Big Planet, um, but that I'd like to see what Gunscape does differently to like help people find the good stuff. Definitely, yeah. So moving on. Uh, Twenty years ago, a game of I'm gonna butcher this name, Umihara Kawase. Kawase. Yeah, it was started. It's a Japanese Super Famicom game. Um, I looked this game up. It appears to be a pretty unremarkable platformer. Apparently, people say it's really difficult. Um, what is remarkable is that the owner of the Super Famicom left the system on for 20 years to preserve this game. It's very still going serious. To this day. Yeah. He was afraid that the internal battery save of cartridge would not hold his file when he turned it off. And he actually said in the article that he turned it off one time to move it because he moved. And he was terrified that when he turned it back on, his file save was going to be gone. So I'm still 20 years and 
only shutting your system off one time. I mean, that just to me that's a testament of how well the old Famicom and Super Nintendo systems were built. Yep. Like and if you leave your Xbox One on now for more than a couple hours, you might your as house well burns just, down. Yeah, you might as well collect that insurance money. It, it's definitely a testament to the quality of the construction, but also just the. Um, I'm just going to say the insanity that some gamers have as far as their stuff go. Because I know, I mean, when I used to have my old Game Boy and I would have Pokemon on there and I wasn't sure what was up. I would just leave it running for a very long time until the battery went out and everything. But I can't I can't I, fathom having it turn on for 20 years. I find it really strange that there's never been a power outage where he lives. Like, really? He's got it on a backup generator. <laughs> yeah. Really? I don't know. No. I don't know. Oh, I thought you were serious. I was like, oh, my God. Because you know what I mean? For it to only go off once ever, like... My power goes out once in a while. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess there could be some caveats to this story. It's I'm neat, To me, what I take away from it is that, like, Nintendo knows how to make some hardware. You stick. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I'm not going to get in with we, they, they, they Don't they start fighting! Make, okay. They might know how to make hardware. We'll, we'll look and see at E3 if E3, maybe they've corrected their mistakes and actually made okay, something. Okay, well, I'll put it this way. They know how to make well-designed hardware. I will give you well that. Well-designed. Very solid. Doesn't give you robust. red rings of death. Doesn't burn your house down. I'll back you 100% on that. Okay. One. It just yeah. turns yellow. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, plastic. Okay. Plastic does that. <laughs> any, any collector knows that. Um, that now we're going to talk about Matt's favorite game franchise. Yay! Pokemon. Robots. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you were so disappointed. Your face, like, melted in front of my eyes. <laughs> Uh, but, I'll, I'll, let me know when you guys are done. I'll, I'll try to I'll try to cram this into a short uh, a short segment. But I'm really really excited. This is amazing. Okay, so first, Michael, I'm going to talk to you because Matt is totally Matt took a smoke break. They're reprinting <laughs> first edition. Smoke- I know so he's, he's so <laughs> mad right now. Huh. They're reprinting first edition Pokemon cards. The cards will be identical to the original print run and launch in Japan February 27th, 2016. No word of a North American release, unfortunately. No surprise there. If there was a North American release, all my money would go towards that. Pokemon. I, I love Pokemon Gotta cards. catch them all. Also, Japan is getting special edition red, blue, green, and yellow 2DS systems with the transparent plastic in that color um, with the respective game pre-installed. So, because we talked about last week how we were getting um, virtual console releases of the original Pokemon games with wireless battling and trading. Yep. Actually, I said battling last week, which is a new thing. North America is getting a Pokemon-themed new 3DS with red and blue uh, game, both the red and blue games installed, so you get two games. Right. Uh, and we get uh, two faceplates, one of, one featuring Charizard, one featuring Blastoise, and Mew is going to be released later this year. Okay. Okay, yeah, go for it. Gotta catch them all. So, so sorry for talking about all that, Matt. Um, he's gonna come back to us in a second. He's crying he in the corner. Yeah, over. he's fainted because we talked about too much Pokemon. Um, check this out. Do you know, Michael, how the Koopaling has got their names? No. <laughs> Do you actually know? Yes. And you're just appeasing me? Okay, great. Well, let me tell you. Uh, Dav Brooks, Dave Brooks. Weird spelling of a name. Dave Brooks, a former product analyst at Nintendo, says, um, Music has always been a big part of my life. I've been a DJ for years and have long been a music collector and even uh, for even he's been a music collector for even longer. Um, when I first saw the group of seven Koopalings, music was on my mind. The hairstyles of one of them reminded me of Ludwig von Beethoven for some reason. And Ludwig von Koopa was born. Ludwig. Speaking is, is difficult for me right now. Ludwig. <laughs> Uh, next was the one with glasses. That was to be uh, Roy Koopa in homage to Roy Orbison, uh, who almost always wore glasses. Then Wendy O. Koopa, Wendy O. Williams, Iggy Koopa, um, inspired by Iggy Pop. Um, one looked like a loudmouth, so he was Morton Koopa Jr. from the loudmouth talk show host Morton Downey Jr. And then there was Larry. There's no real world equivalent. He's not Larry Mullen Jr. from U2 or Larry King. He just looked like a Larry. That brings us to Lemmy. In addition to being a great name, it's perfect for a video game character. Uh, this Koopaling struck me as being the kind of character who would do his own thing, no matter what anyone else thought. I think that I think it was the crazy eyes. Lemmy Koopa was in the crew. That was a quote from Dave Brooks, former product analyst of Nintendo, talking about how the Koopalings got their names. 
Wait, will you tell me that again? Matt is uh, back with us. He fainted for a second. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I've just, it, it's so hot in here and Dan's beard is so wonderful. I get flustered sometimes. Well, you know, not everyone can handle the beardness. It's the, it's the creatures that are inside the beard that are really interesting yeah. to me. You guys are making me uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving on quickly. Um, a boy in his blob uh, was is going to get a re-release on modern consoles. Um, this is the sequel to the NES game. There, uh, on the NES, there's a game, A Boy in His Blob, an amazing strategy platformer. Yeah, it, it's a re-release of the Wii game. Oh, okay, the, Wii, okay. the Wii game was a sequel to the NES game updated graphics developed by way forward who's an amazing mm -hmm. amazing developer they have some of the best concept art in it was a any game. game yeah it was beautiful um pretty cool gameplay basically you feed your pet blob different flavored jelly beans and depending on what flavor you feed him he turns into different structures and creatures and things that'll help you traverse the levels teaching children about obesity the fun way thank you matt you're welcome <laughs> So glad to be back. Um, the Wii game is actually really, really fun. <laughs> I highly recommend it if you can find it. Yeah, it's um, fun. It's going to be released for PS1, sorry, Xbox One, PS4, and uh, PlayStation Vita later this year. PS1? Wow. Yeah, PS1. Awesome. They're going way back. Hardcore retro. The good old uh, black disc. Check this out. Light Gun Games coming to the Wii U. Say what? Hogan's Alley, Wild Gunman, and the Adventures of Bayou Billy. That right there. That's what I would yes. have said. Oh, it's it the remote. I was like, how's that going to work? Guns don't work on TV. No, it's Hogan's Alley. Um, last Hogan. Christmas, Nintendo released Duck Hunt for the Wii U on the virtual mm -hmm. console. With the, you use the pointer from the Wii remote. And it works... Perfectly. Uh -huh. I mean, I would imagine it, that wouldn't work that well because there's the delay, there's the delay on the Wii. They, like, I mean, I don't know. It. Yeah, I, I, I can't find the delay. Well, uh, Michael's doing a little bit of a, of a hand gesture that apparently means fixing, and I'm not sure if that's what it is, but you can keep doing it though. It's good. Okay. High proof. Weird. Anyway, I'm really excited. I love Wild Gunman. Um, that's like one of my favorite light gun games aside from Duck Hunt, so I'm super excited for that. What was the one they released on Super Nintendo? I can never remember what the heck it was. It wasn't Sunset Riders, that was a side scroller. It was um where you played Yoshi's, Yoshi's Safari. No, you were you were a <laughs> it wasn't actually light gun. I mean you, you used the joystick for it, but it was a port of an arcade game where you Home played Alone as a, No. <laughs> you played as a cowboy and then someone almost played as a female. Uh, it was really good. you were like you had to fight like Super RBI. It. You had to fight robots and stuff and RV, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, We're man. helping you. No, I don't know. I don't know. I can't remember what it was, but it was such an awesome What does the game. box art look like? I don't know. You're a cowboy with a machine gun. I mean, you guys, it, it's like really- Oh, it's, it's Super Mario it's, World. <gasps> no, no. Yoshi's Cookie. It's Contra. <laughs> Martha Stewart, Extreme if you know, Edition. If you know what game Matt's talking about, email us at podcast at gameovervideogames.com. Because awesome. we you, don't believe him. You were cowboys <laughs> fighting robots. I mean, it was awesome. You're a liar. You're just lying. Help me out, people. Help me out here. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Um, did you guys see this video about uh, former or former and current Rare, uh, Rare the development company? Um, developers talking about project dream no so project dream was a concept that they had for a video game uh, it was a platformer it was originally going to be an rpg uh, a la mario rpg um and there's a video a little mini doc about out there about developers talking about how that game became banjo kazooie um super interesting if you can find it out there um but yeah, former and current Rare devs, uh, they have screenshots, they have footage you can watch. Um, and it essentially looks like a top-down RPG um, starring this weird-looking character. And then he became a bear, and then they dropped the whole 2D thing when the N64 came out. And then it was still going to be an RPG, but then RPGs weren't selling on the N64, so they saw how well Mario 64 did. So they were like, okay, well, let's just make it a platformer. And it went through all these iterations before they came to like what I would think is one of the best 3D platformers ever made. Easily. Made and, and aged so well Amazing, compared to man. Mario 64. I mean, Mario 64 is great, but because it was so early in the 3D platform business, the camera is kind of jinky. Mm -hmm. But Banjo solved the camera problem. It still plays so good. Yeah. I love Banjo. I love Mario 64 too. And I'm, I actually am in the camp that thinks that Mario 64 is a better game for the basically because. Banjo Kazooie had a few gimmicks that I was not a fan of. For instance, like the trivia game thing, the it was kind of just a filler. Um, whereas Mario 64 is like solid all the way through. But you know, that's a that's a conversation for another podcast. But both masterpieces, though. Yeah, you can totally. agree on that. Absolutely. Sweet. Moving on. Nope, that's it. Have we done now playing yet, or did we just kind of gloss over that? Nope, we changed. I changed now playing. 
I get to choose what we talk about forever. But I want to talk about what I was playing. What were you playing? I was playing playing Diablo. Oh, wow. How do you like it? It's great. There was a new patch. Um... It's actually, I actually had an action RPG week where me and my friends went through and we were like, hey, let's let's play a couple of them. So because the new patch for Diablo 3 came out so you can kill more demons with an axe, you know, yay. Um, We actually went back and grabbed the PS1 version of Diablo and played through that just to see how it'd be different. How bad was it? The console version is actually pretty bad. It's like um, Starcraft 64. Yes. And I was in <laughs> but then but then we went and we played Champions in Norath, which is easily still one of the best action RPGs yeah. ever. So good. And just what once I, I voice this on every show now. I love I love the couch co-op thing where you can grab the multi-tap, have four people play the thing till like two in the morning and just right. hang out and play. So that was awesome. That's great. Loved it. And I wanted to talk about that, Dan, but you know what? Never mind. No, you, you just you have a group where you guys play online together, right? Don't you do that with We your play friends? StarCraft. Or do you do it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Really? It's, just, it's so hard for me. Which StarCraft? Two. Why am I not in this list yet? I want to play. I mean, I haven't played in a long time. I just got Legacy of the Void and I haven't even installed it yet. <laughs> Legacy it's of the just... Void. I, I love the story. I love the story of StarCraft. I'm a huge sci-fi fan, so Legacy of the Void is like right up my alley. Um, that's not what I'm playing this week, though. This week, I played a lot more Xenoblade Chronicles X, but I'm not going to talk about that anymore because spoilers and it's what we're talking about the second half of this podcast. Dance but um, I'm getting really into, gosh, I mean, honestly, I'm playing the same stuff this week as I played last week because nothing came out. Um, yeah, I'm playing a lot more Fast Racing Neo, and it just makes you hungry for more F-Zero. Um, I actually I actually went and picked up a copy of F-Zero GX, um, yeah. and I haven't played it yet because I wanted to get through Fast Racing Neo and really like see that whole game first. So, um, Fast Racing Neo, if you didn't hear the last podcast, is a very, very F-Zero-like uh, racer on the Wii U virtual console. Or not virtual console. It's on the eShop. Um, so, well, closest thing we're going to get to an F-Zero. Yeah, it's amazingly like F-Zero. It's actually really, really good replacement if you're missing an F-Zero. But it just really, at this point, it just makes me want to play um, GX even more. So I'm going ba- I'm going to go back and do me a little um, F-Zero retrospective. Uh, I'm going to try to find the Super Nintendo game, which is pretty easy to find. Mm-hmm. The N64 game, F-Zero X, surprisingly expensive and hard to find. It's it's actually been going up yeah. in recent years, but um, still a darn good game, mm-hmm. though. Yeah, GX was pretty cheap. I don't know why. Have you heard about snaking yet in GX? Has that term come up with you at all yet? Yeah, that's where you do the like back uh-huh. and forth stra- uh, strafing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And go like insanely fast. You could do that in that. Mario Kart... DS as well, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and people got really mad online when not to the extreme degree, but yeah. Yeah, um, but I just want to. Yeah, I mean, I love F Zero. I think it's probably it's one of my favorite racing games ever made. And yep, we so, need another one. <laughs> I mean, I'm really happy with F Racing F uh, with Fast Racing Neo. There's um, no Captain Falcon in it, Dan. You know, <laughs> show me your moves, <laughs> Michael. What are you playing? Um, I got Xenoblade X. So I started it, yeah. and I'm also playing Final Fantasy XIV, like, nonstop. Still rocking. Same as last week, then? Yeah. yeah it just, no, sorry, last week. It was just, like, the Christmas holidays and stuff. It was just it's so easy. Yeah. So, but, uh, yeah. How far are you? Oh, never, we'll talk about Xenoblade when we get up there. I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're going to talk about Xenoblade a whole lot in a little bit. Um, so that's that's it for the news and now playing and all of that. So uh, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about... Xeno stuff and some monolithness and um robots. yeah stick around it's gonna have robots we'll see you later Muppet Babies Muppet Babies they'll make our dreams, dreams come, come true, true. Da, 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 da. Muppet, Muppet Babies they'll do the same for you, you. when you're Muppet it's kind of weird and you wish that, that you were there just close your eyes oh and God. make believe and you can be that was lovely. My bad. Baby. I love that. Why are we talking talk about video games, really? I mean, this yeah, is like a straight that, musical though. podcast. On February 7th, Game Over Video Games is celebrating the release of Final Fantasy Explorers for the 3DS. Bring your 3DS to any Game Over Video Games location from 3 to 6 p.m. for Street Pass Sunday. Don't have Final Fantasy Explorers? No problem! Bring any games you like and join the fun. Street Pass Sunday happens the first Sunday of every month at your local Game Over store. Get more info at GameOverVideoGames.com. What's another line from... Xeno, Xeno Gear, Xenoblade. Besides, I'm really feeling it. 
I've repressed them. I, <laughs> I heard them. It's the point where you hear them so much, you hear them in your sleep. And then there's the point past that where you just, you don't even hear them anymore. It's like a crying child. It's like, whatever. I just only remember the one that Ryan says where he's like, no one. All right. And it's like really sad. Like he says something. He's, I always forget what he says, but he says something and it's about like, aren't you glad I was here? And then like, nobody says anything. He's like, the no one. Accent oh, I just love how, how, how there's no shame in the, in any of these games. They just, they know what they are. And there's they're no option to shame. Anime. Yeah. Yeah. God, I wish there was sometimes. But I mean, I just love how shameless it is. They don't, they don't, they don't try to remove the Japanese, like, you know, ness of it. They just get run with it. And I love that. I think it's fantastic. You either, either love it or you don't. That's just you the really way it is. Do. Yeah. yeah. Man, so let's talk a little bit about the early years of Monolith Soft and how it all yeah. started. Because it's a pretty interesting story. Um, I'm going to butcher this dude's name and I'm really, really sorry. Go for it. Tets, Tetsuya Takahashi. Oh, not bad. You got that. Bad. There you go. We're going to call him Takahashi san from now Gold on. Gold star. Uh, Takahashi san is currently the head of game software company Monolith Soft Inc. In the past, Takahashi has worked at Square, um, now Square Enix, and he worked on such games as Final Fantasy V, VI. Um, he was the graphics director on Chrono Trigger, which is awesome. Um, he worked closely with the dude from Dragon Ball Z. Can't remember his name right now. Akira Toyama. That's the one. Akira who was Toyama. who was the art director on that game. Sounds like a song. Um, yeah, Xenogears was Takahashi-san's directorial debut. It was the first game he ever directed. Um, That's a pedigree right there. And it That's was, what that yeah, is, buddy. It Ooh. was published by uh, Squaresoft. Um, while at Squaresoft, Takahashi realized that the company intended to focus on the Final Fantasy series. No. Yeah. <laughs> Which is weird because I don't, I don't, rem- I don't no, recognize I've that really name. I've never seen any Final games Fantasy. From that. You'd think if they would focus on you know releasing one every decade like they have with 15, it wouldn't be quite so bad. But <clears throat> I digress though. <laughs> yeah, he was worried that sequels to the Xenogears series were becoming unlikely. So in 1999, he formed Monolith Soft. The company would work together with other game companies to produce such games like Bait and Kaidos, Super Smash Bros. Brawl, Zelda Skyward Sword, and Project, about that one. Project X Zone. Um, even back with Square Enix, uh, he even worked with Square Enix on uh, the Final Fantasy VII game Dirge of Cerebrus. Cerebrus. Dirt, dirt, pretty good game. Whatever. Dirt, 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 you're talking about the golden age of RPGs right there is when Squaresoft was at their absolute peak of awesome sauce. So you think they're coming off of the Mario RPGs and the Chrono Triggers going through Final Fantasy. And then you had this, this, this Xenogears game, this wonderful original IP where it's like, hey, we're going to take Final Fantasy gameplay, but change the battle system into almost like a neat little combo system. And we're going to have this really cool music come in and we're going to have this really deep philosophical delving into all kinds of different religious backgrounds story. Oh, and by the way, we're going to have freak and robots in it too. I Uh-oh. mean, oh there's the word. Oh, buddy. Mm. I love how it was such a trans a, a transitional period because up until this point, every RPG was basically like a top-down view, and it was sprites, and it was these big sprawling worlds, and some of them had those like that like mode seven 3D thing mm-hmm. going on, like a later in the Super Nintendo life. Right. But um, this was the first time when you really could have like polygons. And, and, you know, your worlds didn't have to be so flat. And people were really experimenting a lot with that. And um, Xenogears is an incredibly transitional game because you could split between the sprites, which are the pe- people, and then these giant robots, which were 3D, mm-hmm. uh, 3D poly- polygons, um, which to this day still look really, really good. Like, oh, yeah. You know, I look at, we were talking about Final Fantasy VII last time and how some of the graphics are kind of... Dim Lego hands. Weird. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so that game didn't graphically did not age well, but <laughs> as you guys are doing some weird dance. <laughs> well, it's just like all the Lego movement, hand dance. Blah, blah, it was yeah. just like any time they tried to like show any like emotion, it was like that like, arm just like moves up and down. <laughs> <laughs> blonky, blonky. Okay. But for some reason, uh, the sprites worked really, really well in Xenogears yeah. because you had these tiny sprites and then these giant polygon, polygonal robots that looked so cool. And even the world looked really cool in 3D and... Really, really nice pre-rendered background. Yeah, big and sprawling. Yeah. It had anime cutscenes. Um, 
Which, I mean, were like long cutscenes. Especially for that time mm-hmm. period. The only game I remember having anime cutscenes of that ilk before that was like Lunar mm-hmm. on Sega CD. Which, yeah. once you get a disc based system, was the only thing where it was possible. But, oh, so good. Xenogears is so good where I could honestly say I would still love it almost as much if it didn't have the robots in it. Right. And that's really wow. saying something for me. Wow, I'll tell you man. what. I don't believe it. I mean, like, you you take pretty much exclusively out. play games with robots in them. So. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like when he goes up to the counter, he's like, Is there a robot in there? You got anything with that gun? And I'm tight too, please. <laughs> On on that Mario stuff. I'm gonna play one to not open until I'm 45. <laughs> one to save for my nest egg. Yeah. <laughs> this will pay for my son's college tuition someday. <laughs> Just ignore the the Wii U fanboys here, gentlemen. It's Whatever. okay. Don't worry about it. I love my Wii U. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Anyway, back to Xeno Gears. Um, really, uh, really, Matt. I haven't played it in so long. Matt's the only one that's played it recently. Mm-hmm. But um, as far as the battle system goes, yeah, it was. It was the first. It was one of the first games to really turn, take the turn-based system and turn it right on its head and say, right. "Nope, like we're gonna go pretty much fighting well, it's, game." It's still turn-based. Yeah, um, it's like what uh, Final Fantasy VI and VII did, though, where, where they had the ATB system, where technically it's still turn-based, but different attacks take different time. It's like what they did with uh, Grandia. Um, I don't think one, but Grandia Two had it, where certain attacks would you could see if I did this attack, it would take that much longer for me to do something again. They had more of a wait system, where like after you attack, you have to wait this long. Well, in Gears, and what they ended up following in, I think the first Xeno. Saga, and then they changed it for some stupid reason, um, where you had action points, a set number of action points where you could do stuff, and you could either use those in this turn to do certain attacks, or you could save them to do more or better attacks, and you could string together different combos, which just... They did that in the Four Heroes of Light in the DS. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of the same thing, except in that game, for some reason, would let you target people, which is just weird, but... Yeah, and it's cool to see those mechanics still in play Mm -hmm. today with Xenoblade Xenoblade and Xenoblade Chronicles X. Mm -hmm. I mean, you still have TP, you still have kind of the weight system, you know. Um, I was actually going to say, I actually don't like how it's changed because the xenoblade combat system makes me angry it feels like an mmo yeah it feels like an mmo but you're by yourself Mm -hmm. i'll I'll talk about that when we get to xenoblade but it's one of the one of my Mm -hmm. actually one of my issues with the game so xeno gear is the battle system right really good battle system Mm -hmm. and that translates over to the robots where it's the it's the same type of system but it adds a couple different layers to it. you have to worry about your robots armor and the fuel and stuff like that which is just and it's robots, man. I mean, come on. Ugh. Oh, my God. Sorry. Robot Sorry. fuel is not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, buddy. T- uh, $94 a gallon. I'm just killing my wallet. Oh, and, and, and we live in Texas. Can you so, I have a fun fact about Xeno Gears you may or may not have known. Um, Xeno Gears was originally submitted as a potential plot for Final Fantasy VII. Did you know that? that? I can see that. Isn't that cool? Um, it was That's made cool. into its own project after being judged too dark and complicated for a fa- complicated is game. definitely right. Yeah, and I, I, mean, I don't want to very down... religious sort of religious undertones oh, yeah. going on there. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, I don't want to down Final Fantasy games because I love Final Fantasy. I love their stories, but Xenogears definitely has one of the deepest, most kind of interleaving stories I've ever seen. Where you can play the game once and ignore it, and just kind of have you know it's like well you're the good guy, fight the bad guy, hooray, and that's it. And it's a good RPG if that's what you're in it for. The reason I play RPGs though is almost exclusively for the story to be able to take him for that epic ride where you're like you're reading a long book me but you're too. playing the long book yeah um where for me oh, you know the combat system and and the visual and the graphics and everything that's if anything just a vehicle for me to get into the game so if the combat system kind of kind of blows like what i think it does in xenoblade where it may not be the best combat system if the story is good i can overlook that but if it's a good solid combat system like in final fantasy you know seven eight nine or xeno xeno gears too many xenos god um <laughs> then that just it makes it easier for me to kind of flow into the story which xeno gears had so well i mean without i we could talk about the story for I know. We're probably going to glaze over the yeah. story because we could have to do a whole podcast. Oh, yeah. On that. J- just to be quick with it, though, I mean, you literally have, um, you know, the main character who is the reincarnation, technically, so to speak, of some other name. The game is came out in the spoiler? 90s. I don't care. Um, yeah. Massive yeah, so. You just want to say it to cover the ground. Well, so it's, now, it's like. has heard me say that. So, that may so now there may, will be spoilers. There may or may not be spoilers. Let me just say before we have spoilers that um, I recommend Xenogears if you're a hardcore RPG fan yes. and nothing less. Most because definitely. this game it was brutal and long. Well, what, what we'll do then without without divulging too much details, Xenogears, uh, Final Fantasy X borrowed their story very heavily from Xenogears. It kind of simplified it a bit, where the whole point of the game is that you are, at the end of the game, fighting the concept of God. Not quite necessarily God himself, but the concept. You're fighting this this machine called Deus. 
um, you know, Slide God or whatever. But um, and Deus may or may not contain the actual spirit of God, where you actually talk to the spirit later in the game, and he goes, "Yeah, you could consider me God. I'm not really God, but it works the same way. It's okay." Um, it's just a really, really cool game where it delves into different philosophies, and you know, your your character is actually a reincarnation of another character who has been spending generations trying to fight Deus, and Deus makes his own contrasting characters, which um, have similarities to a lot of different biblical. I mean, the two of the main enemies in the beginning of the thing were Cain and Abel. I mean, it's 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 not being subtle with it at all. Um, Pretty cool. I yeah. like I like when games take really heavy like. Uh, undertones from society like either political or religious or Mm -hmm. something like that and use them in in a fantasy realm um i think it's really smart i like when they do that it works you can draw lots of stuff to it and it has the the whole concept of this one where the bad guy is the bad guy isn't god the bad guy is the corrupt individuals who are running the organization which is what 10 did a lot where you know yevon was the bad guy in 10 where the church was the bad thing where but the the religion based on it wasn't it was the people that had kind of twisted it and done bad stuff to it and i i I like that i think that worked out quite well for the story anyways sorry no Um, you're good um this this game was released in 1998 and they expected there to be many, many sequels, and uh, <sighs> we never got a direct sequel to Xenogears. That's like the story of this game, of this series' existence. Yeah, like, there's it, gonna it be just kept sequels. being remade. Um, uh, but we did get Xenosaga, which isn't so much a game as it is a playable anime. Hey, hey, hey now. Hey now. <laughs> hey now. <laughs> I go back to my original point where I love Xenosaga because I love those. Xenosaga, if you all haven't played it yet, where it's it takes place, and this can be argued, but it technically takes place in the same universe as Gears. If you look into the fluff behind Gears, um, the ship in Gears, the Eldritch that contained Deus, launches a specific year, and that's the same year where the Milshin conflict happens in Xenosaga. So it's like it's like Chronicles and Chronicles X, where it takes place in the same overarching universe, but yeah. different planets, right. which is pretty sweet because you you don't have that's to know cool. that you have to dig into it. But um, it's more or less the same type of game where you have the combo system and the robots and the religious and the philosophical lines in it. Um, what Xenosaga is mostly known for, though, with people is 45 minute long cutscenes. Yeah, which I love because once again, it's a vehicle to the, to the story for me. Yeah. Original Xenosaga Episode 1 for, uh, released for the PlayStation 2 on uh, February 28th, 2001 in North America. Um, to much fanfare, it got really good reviews. Mm, it great was, game. It was, the, it was kind of the post... It was kind of the post crazy uh, RPG, um, late 90s RPG craze where people were trying to figure out what they were going to do with all these RPGs now that we had this amazing graphical power. Um, and I actually agree with you that uh, Xenosaga kind of went in the right direction in making, I mean, I made fun of it earlier, but it is in a, in a sense a playable anime where it's very story driven. Um, and it was before you had things like Grand Theft Auto where you had mm-hmm. this immense freedom. You could do whatever you want. Um, you, you, if you were into RPGs, you were used to having a really, really detailed and intense story. So I think it was the right move uh, for the time. Most definitely. Yeah. Um, um, the whole you, series really was... Uh, you you mentioned earlier that there were supposed to be six of these games. Yeah. When Xenosaga was originally announced, there were supposed to be six games. And then there was even rumors that Gears was going to tie into it and possibly be like... I remember specifically reading a magazine. Oh, here's how old Matt is. On the bus coming home from high school, I was reading about Xenosaga. (laughs) Aw, you're Um, cute. I'm old. Um, Reading about how they were rumored that Xenogears was actually going to be remade into, I think they were saying episode 5 of the thing. And it was going to tie into the whole story, which for me, having just played Xenogears, I'd be like, oh my god! Um, Super, super awesome. Unfortunately, though, due to... Did you do that on the bus? Did you like... I I, I went like... "Ah!" And then they, they they moved me even one seat further back, so I was back by the emergency door. They it's put just, you in the front. Yeah, so I could get out very fast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this this is already like Transformers robot Matt, so I didn't have a lot of friends. It's it's okay though, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> but we're his friends now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's what I've what I've got to work with, Dan and Michael and a. And then Knuckles the kid in a costume. Yeah. I mean, you're a jerk, but you're like our jerk. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. take it. Like, as long as I'm somebody's jerk. <laughs> that's a jerk. He's a jerk, but that's our jerk. He's like our family. Jerk. Yeah. I'm a jerk with a soothing voice. But it, due to budget we keep constraints and thank you. <laughs> due Sorry. to stuff like that, they ended up canceling four, five, and six. Right. And at this point, they'd made one, they made two, they'd made some changes in two, like they changed the battle system in two, which I thought was a little bit of a letdown. And they cut 
they cut the cutscenes, so most of them are much shorter, which also was a little bit disappointing because the story wasn't quite as well implemented. Yeah, because and they, they looked had a little different about. too. Oh yeah, they did. Well, the, the redesign I didn't mind too much because it yeah. just happens, but it was kind of right. weird. Like Cosmos looks human now. Yeah, it was less anime style, the more right. real it went to. Um, but with three, when they were developing three, they decided they weren't going to make a four, five, or six, so they had to all of a sudden cram in the rest of the Wrap story, three, four, five, and six right. into one game. Yeah, well, at that point in just the world of game development, um, you know. Grand Theft Auto had come out with two games and, you know, uh, just games had started to evolve more. They, they went from kind of like it, playable animes weren't something people wanted anymore. They wanted a lot more control. They Speak wanted to be yourself, to, Susan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they wanted to be able to go and figure out this guy's story and go over there and go behind this building and do whatever they wanted, uh, you know, a la Legend of Zelda and not not have to follow, you know, the script that the game developer decided for them. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a quote from uh, Takahashi talking uh, Takahashi Takahashi talking about uh, why he remade his franchise so many times. Um, he says uh, it's probably more suitable to say that it follows in the direction and style of Xenogears. He's talking about Xenosaga. Um, now that we're under a different company, we figured we should start everything from scratch all over again. Um, he's talking about the transition from Square to Monolith. Uh, though there are familiar faces that serve as important characters in Xenosaga, others are more like self-parodies. Um, so we don't really want Xenogears fans to overreact. Like movies, sometimes you have the director of the movie or friends of the leading actor appearing as cameos. Uh, so it's similar to that. So he really, he really does think of his franchises as as movies, as stories, and less as a uh, quote-unquote interactive medium where you get to decide whatever you do. Um, and that's, honestly, I think that's something that's missing from a lot of games nowadays, where you just, especially last year, where we have Witcher 3, and, you know, Xenoblade, and Metal Gear, and... Dragon Age. Dragon Age. I mean, all these open-world games, it's almost too much. Like, I almost need, wish that I had more games holding my hand and saying, like, here's the story. Like, Sometimes linear is good. I mean, exactly. you, you have stuff like... Um... Well, I forgot the name of it now, but that that horror game that came out that I've actually I'm playing right now. And I can't remember the name um, of it, for PS4. It wasn't uh, Dying Light. That was a different. No, one. Why? Um, until dawn. Until dawn. That one. That's oh, really yeah. good. Where it's it, so it's, it's good. a playable horror movie, and that's it, it fantastic. Is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and that well, literally games like uh, modern games like Uncharted. You know, mm -hmm. there's very very linear, and yeah. and that's good. That's, that's, okay. that's a good thing. Those games. You know, maybe you want some more exploration, but honestly, you sacrifice the exploration to have a really solid story. Um, and then, and yeah. I, I got to tell you, I think that's where Xenoblade suffers a little bit, where it's a beautiful game world. It has great design. Um, it's got robots. So check mark there. Um, it's it's lacking. It's like what killed me on Dragon Age. I've never been able to finish Dragon Age because it puts me to sleep. Um, I like fantasy settings. I like, you know, dragons and awesome stuff like that. But it's like, I just don't care what's happening. I, Move on. I've read all the books, so it made a difference. And the books yeah. are fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather read no, the books. No, but I get it. Game. If you want to, if you just play Dragon Age to play it. It's different than if you actually know like the history of the realm. Then it then it's different. I might have to do that because yeah. I yeah. I read a lot of books too. So, yeah. but see, I managed to get through Mass Effect because once again the combat system was better, so it got me, it propelled yeah. me through the story. But if, if a story, you're like, also thinking about the video game into mechs. So it yeah, yeah but <laughs> the thing about video games is. It, if you if it's story driven, that's fine. You still have to have solid mechanics. Mm -hmm. No, you right. can't bore me to death with lore, you know, and expect me to be engaged if your combat system's garbage. Right, yeah. that's true. But totally. uh, you know, I don't think Xenosaga suffered too much. I think that it did what it set out to do, and then with Xenoblade and Chronicles X, it really went into more of an open world direction, but in in, in a unique unique way i mean the settings were extremely unique i mean you play either of those games and it's n like nothing you've ever played before we can jump into some xenoblade if you guys are ready would, yeah. would you say dan that they were really feeling it i know that i was really feeling it when i played them Matt. i'm not feeling this well, there's a door over there, Bye. Michael. Get out! <laughs> no, be please. A regular no way. You're playing Xenoblade, so we need you to talk about yeah. it. Well, oh. I've been I've been in the middle of the first one because I got it. So, I, so I, just to clarify, you're playing the 3DS version of which was originally a, re, a Wii game, mm -hmm. the original Xenoblade. And I have the Wii U one. I got that. Uh, but I've, you know, I've started well, the first. The first in the Xenoblade series is the one you're playing on the 3DS. Yeah. Yeah. The Shulk one. Yes. Yeah. It's um. I played the I'm most really of it, it when I played it on the Wii. 
And, and at first I was like, oh, no, the, the graphics difference isn't that big of a deal, but it is kind of a big deal. But then, you know, other stuff came out. The 3DS one is all kinds of blurry, dude. Yeah, oh, it's man. good, and it's neat that it runs on there, but at the same time, it's like, I definitely can tell the difference. Yeah. And at first I, like, tried to lie to myself about it, but no. <laughs> it's beautiful. It is a big, <laughs> yeah. sprawling, beautiful game that you try to fit on tiny screen. It is. Which is nice. But it's, um, it's still, video, it's still but, you know. fun. It's still as fun as it was on the Wii. I like it better on the go. Um, it feels like an MMO by myself. You know, it's interesting because on the Wii version, it's not quite as bad, but on the 3DS version and on the and on Wii U with Xenoblade Chronicles X, I cannot read half the text in that game. And I've got a big TV, and I'll lean forward and be like, you just did what? With what? At least it's a pretty color because I can't see what the heck's going on. It's terrible. And then some of the dialogue, some of the written dialogue is so bad. I know I mentioned this before, but I was playing it more. And it's like, I'd, I'd like to know what that robot weapon does, but I can't read it. Yeah. Right. So what? What? So the jump from Xenosaga to Xenoblade is pretty significant. Oh, I yeah. Mean, oh, yeah. It's pretty much a generation jump because mm -hmm. you go from the end of PS2 to pretty much the end of Wii. Um, and they spent that whole time developing this game Xenoblade. Um you know, I mean, obviously, the studio was working on other things at the time, too. But, I mean, you went from almost exclusively story-driven to now you're in this open world, which is which is just, I mean... It's still, like, there's definitely the main storyline. Oh, yeah. But there's so many little side things you can do, which is, like, good or bad with me. It took, it took a very Western approach to RPGs, where once again, you have the Dragon Age Mass Effect Witcher thing, where you have an open world where you can take the story and the bites that you want and then do other stuff. Right. Yeah, for sure. Which in concept is awesome. But what makes it unique from, say, like, you know, Legend of Zelda or another RP, or another open world RPG, Xen the original Xenoblade? Easily the setting. I mean, yeah. the game takes place on top of two giant robots. Yeah. Well, well one of them's an organic And it robot, really, it's like, what, you really want to be, you're like, what is this about? Yeah. You know what I mean? I, like, that, well, that opening cutscene is like, oh. Was that a spoiler? And I live here. No, it's not. Open cutscene, you realize okay. they're yeah. on two giant mechs. Yeah. Yeah, it's literally just... Full disclosure, I never played the original Xenoblade. Yeah, it's... Spoilers, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! But, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you can see it on the cover of the game, where it's it's the... the um, right, I've seen the cover, I yeah. I think the blade is, but um, with Makanis in the background, which is one of the two giant figures. Essentially two gods. That's really cool. Out. There's yeah. one that's like living organism, Bi yeah, and one Bionis. is like... Bionis is, yeah. the, and, Bionis is the living one, and, and then Makanis is the, is the evil giant robot. robot. And these two big just giant figures, like the open cuts is them just sword fighting. And then they in, like, are locked. Ocean. They like had one final strike, and then they got locked together, yeah. and then they froze. And that's the... And then life... Began. Yeah, that's where the game world takes place is on these and two so, giant fig like corpses. So the robots fly figures. over to Bionis and like start hurting the squishy human people, and that's the beginning. Never heard. I of love that. RPGs. They just. But yeah, that's they what don't have to me. make sense. That's what hooked <laughs> me, and then it has like stuff that happens that's pretty dramatic and it's good and it's got little stuff like you should. I'll let you borrow it. Yeah, it's it's the Monado. I think you right? might like it. Best thing I would love Blade, to play Michael. It. It's the Monado. It's the Monado. I almost called it the Menudo, and that just went. <laughs> The menudo blade. <laughs> the menudo Yummy blade. Pig intestines. <laughs> Delicious. Sorry. I was thinking of like the boy band. Um, oh, so geez. I have. Yeah. Oh, gross. That's grosser than the pig intestine. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a lot of experience with Xenoblade Chronicles X, which is the first Xeno game that I ever played. I mean, really based on word of mouth. I mean, everyone, everyone, it came out in Japan first, almost a year ahead of the North American release. And everyone kept talking about how amazing it was. And I mean, I just had to, you know, I needed something to play on my Wii U because as Matt will point out, there's nothing to play on the Wii U. Don't <laughs> give him fuel. <laughs> I, I, I don't need it. It's right there for everyone to see, man. Um, so I, I think that... I can, from here you guys talk about the uh, early Xeno games. It's definitely... I mean, it's definitely in the same vein. Yes. Like a lot of the battle system, even though it's it's a different battle system, it borrows a lot of the same it, things. And the big difference I noticed right away was the gun and then the close range thing. Like mm -hmm. you don't really the switch have... between. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. really yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I like the battle system in Xenoblade Chronicles X. I just think that um, why can, why can't you heal? Why isn't there a heal button? So yeah, there you really you need can, to kind figure of, out what's going of. on on your own in that game. Um, I had to read the manual all the way through. And you hear me talk about that. I bought the guys too. Um, I haven't is, bought a guide in forever. The guide doesn't help that much in some cases. Oh, here here's That's the true. thing, and I I know how to heal now because it's a quick time event that pops up. Um, I hate quick time events with a righteous passion. Why can't I just just be like? 
Cool. I hit X to heal, and that used my TP. Awesome. I have this bag of no, but there potions. are there are um, arts that you can learn yes. to do that. So um, it just it's super limited. Like why can't there there the closest thing to the healer class is um, the one blonde lady. I can't remember what class she was because it was a weird mm -hmm. name, but there is no dedicated, there is no white mage. Where are my white mages? Where are my black mages? Yeah, there's not in any of the skill trees. But like it's, a, it's a different, I mean, I think that the battle system lends itself to giving you the option to make that character if you want. I mean, you can change all of your character's arts. You can change your own arts. You can give every person a healing art if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I save a whole lot in that game because I don't know if I'm going to turn a corner and find a level 60 flying thing. Tyrant and, like, of Doom. It's going to try to attack me, and I'm going to be like, With, like oh, wings well, on kill. its head and, yeah. like, a tail. I mean, now that I have my scale, I don't have to worry about that as much. But um, Transform. I will say that, and I'm, I differ I differ than you, Matt, in, this, in that I love just exploring. Like, it's one of the reasons why Wind Waker is my favorite Zelda game. I just love having this giant open world, With and there's little tiny things in it that I have to discover. And, I mean, I had no trouble playing this game because I found it fun to just not do a mission, just go out in the world and collect things and find weird enemies. And so by the time I get to actually doing the missions, I did half of them because... I just explored it, you know? Well, I'm 100% I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Um, what kept me playing, because I actually haven't played Xenoblade Chronicles X for like three weeks now, just because I haven't felt I'm like, like 60 to 70 hours. <laughs> I th I think I'm actually right there with you, because I just yeah. kind of like oh, binged yeah. it for a little while. Yeah, you Because um, we're like on chapter eight or nine now, so we've gotten pretty mm -hmm. far. Yeah, me too. Um, like Dan just got his flying scale, and I have the quest to get my flying scale, so we're about right there. Um, I was getting pretty bored with the game, and then I got my scale, which was just a wonderful series of... Junk, you had to get your scale. Thankfully, I honestly, half of it was done, I did but... most of that already. Yeah, most yeah. of my stuff was done already, which is nice because it was like I have to collect like mm -hmm. 20 different things. Screw you, game, but I already had most of it, so that was good. <laughs> um, you mean the glowing orbs? Yeah. Yeah. There, when you get your scale, do you have to do a series of exams to get your scale? Which well, in theory like sounds cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, is, which, is, which is great. Let me just do that in the video game. Um, although, if there was an exam for a giant robot, I'd be the first person in the line. Just saying. Um, Half of the tests are like the mini little mini quests where it's like go find X number of blue gems and profit. Um, but thankfully those were mostly done because I, I like to run out and collect stuff anyways. Um, once I got the robot, running around and exploring was awesome because the robot has this amazing jump arc. Mm -hmm. And whenever I play anything like this, mostly in MMO, but any open world games like this, I love to try to break the game and go to places where I can't go. Yeah, just me keep too. jumping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where I just went all over the place and yeah. immediately hit like... 20 or 30 of those uh, points mm -hmm. I couldn't hit before and that was awesome what kind of bugged me about Xenoblade is that was really cool but being 60 hours into the game I'm still not feel I'm not, I'm, I wasn't really feeling the story <laughs> I wasn't really feeling it guys well, when it yeah. was released like I heard a quote and it was like next time we're going to focus on the story and that made me that was a terrible yeah. quote <laughs> yeah and it was like it was like this time it was something like you know, somebody read into it, but the, the whole tag of the article mm -hmm. I read was that was what they took from yeah, the conversation, and that. that made me nervous. I was like, oh, okay. And I can, I totally understand that. Um, it really depends on what kind of gamer you are. They're, they're the gamers who, like, I want to get to the next part of the story, and that's my motivation for playing. Um, some games are like that, but I think this game keeps me coming back because I'm always thinking about this one area in... Um, Noctilium? Noctilium. Yeah. There's like this, there's a waterfall and then there's, you can see on the map, there's like lava and you can't get there yet until you get the flying scale. And I haven't made it up there yet. Cause I've been doing other stuff. So as soon as I get home today, I'm going to go find out what's in that Fly giant your lava. Butt up yeah. there. Probably a that's what keeps gonna me going be because it's going to be like a little rat. Just like chilling. Like, what's that? I'll be like, Hey, and there's like a blue glowing orb. Spoiler next to alert. Room. That's just kidding. generic blue glowing orb. Isn't even special. Yeah, and it's, like, just hey, like, it's a fuse box. Yeah. It's a fuse. <laughs> but those are the kinds of things that keep me going in games is the, the mystery element. Um, and so no, I, I guess it just kind of depends. And I could totally see why someone would be like, wow, this story is really lacking. And it took me three. I mean, it took me five chapters into the game before I hit my first story point that I genuinely cared about. Which is about 20, 30 hours. Yeah, I have I mean, a problem no joke. with open world games. If it doesn't catch me enough to make me keep going, yeah. I float away. Mm -hmm. So like Skyrim, I'm like, oh, Literally here's, a, floats here's, away. here's a cave. Oh, here's a cave. Oh, here's a cave. Oh, here's, I can go into this waterfall, 
oh, you know what I mean? Like I flowed away. Yeah. Like and so And I need the time to do that too, which is nowadays is Yeah. Is, it gets uh, more difficult elusive. with this whole being a grown up thing and stuff. Now, yeah. When I think about games that like really, really old open world games, I think about like Legend of Zelda, the original yeah. Legend of Zelda. Right. What that about- game had almost no story. Hmm. But, but take it this. showed you it showed you what to do. It was like, hey, you know, like there's a cave over here, but you can't get there because you need this thing. And then and then you finally you don't even know what cave. that thing is, though. Half the time it's like, I'm just gonna... well, yeah, but once you get it, there's like this aha moment where you're like, oh, this is a bridge. OK, I can cross this river now. And or, you know, oh, I have I have um, arrows so I can shoot this thing and get, you know, activate this and get through the thing. And. And, um, you know, in the, in the NES days, you didn't need a lot of narrative and story. And if you had it, it was nice. You just need friends who knew what was, to do. Yeah, it was really filler because because the gameplay was so engaging. True, 100%. Yeah. But also at that point, I would never call Zelda an RPG, ever. Um, it has elements, but it's definitely more of an adventure game than an RPG. Not a traditional, yeah. not traditional in the, RPG, not yeah. in the traditional like definition of an RPG where like you level up your gear yeah. and stuff like that. Because traditional RPGs are all about stats. Uh, mm-hmm. Because if you think RPG, you think D and D. There you go. Nicely done, Michael. Mm-hmm. Uh, where you have the stats and the gear, yes. and you also have the really yeah. awesome stuff. A lot of math. Yeah. All the math. Exactly. Oh, never exactly. never play second edition. Yeah. Thacko can do you have <laughs> Okay. Yeah, you're way, way over. If you have the elements there that, that still give you a good story and a reason to play, um, which uh, I think RPGs, you have to have that story because you need a reason to level up. Like there's a lot of grinding in traditional RPGs mm-hmm. that pushed people away for a long time before story really became the reason to play. Yeah, that was why um, you get into it. And you're like, I got to be stronger so I can find out what happens to this yeah, person. Sure. All that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Which is why I play RPGs most of the time anyways. Yeah. Now, you mentioned open world games. And going on a bit of a tangent here into uh, Sega Genesis land, which is where I live most of the time. Um, have either one of How's the ever... weather in Sega Genesis land? Is it... It's kind of cold. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're not feeling uh, it. Full of, full, of, full of some of the hedgehogs that haven't been making good games for a while. But I'm sorry, Matt. No, it's okay. I'll accept it. Okay, so go, what's what's your <laughs> Um There was a really, really cool open world, um, I guess you'd call it adventure action RPG game called Land Stalker. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Very Zelda-ish, but with a little bit more story. Um, and you had awkward jumps. And you could you could actually jump, I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. Is, well, it's isometric. Jumping and isometric, like we talked about with Sonic uh, 3D Blast, never yeah. works that well. <laughs> yes. But thankfully, there wasn't quite as much of it in that one. Um, really good open world game where I, th- I can kind of see there were the puzzles that required there. jumping though oh boy yeah <laughs> platforms that dropped and you had to get mm-hmm. special boots that let you jump higher and anyway sorry moving on but that's I can see that's the kind of game where you're talking about where it's mm-hmm. open world and there's a story to it but it's all kind of just guesswork and figure things out and progress with the story it's very Zelda-ish but yeah. I think that's more adventure than RPG for though. sure yeah um, and uh, I even have a quote here from Sa- the late Satoru Iwata um talking about the development of Xenoblade Chronicles X. He was saying that they wanted to create a large-scale uh, open world with seamless exploration, um, the biggest world that you could possibly make on the Wii U, and they definitely succeeded. Um, and I think that they had to sacrifice story elements in order to make that a reality because, uh, you know, you only have so much development time when yeah. you're making a game. And it's the Wii U, and it can only yeah. do so much. I mean, um, and not trying to, at that point, not trying to be a, a Wii U hater, but it's true. I mean, the Wii U is hardware-wise sure. very limited in what it can do. Now, and I'm I'm inclined to say that you don't need hardware to make a great game. No, not whatsoever. Uh, and at all. And I think anybody would agree with you. But, but the limitations it- of the Wii U making it, like, you know, the world... It's not empty, but the enemies are definitely generic. Hmm. And there's a lot of, and the landscape is beautiful and explorator, explorative, but the characters are really uninteresting. Yeah. And so you kind of have to make your. And the world has somewhere. lots of pop up and stuff too. Exactly. Yeah. I would say if you're going to make a technically advanced game, um, I, I'm confused as to why you would make it on the least technically advanced system, especially if you are going to neglect story for the shininess when it's the least shiny hardware available. But there's nothing else like it on that system no you're right 100% so it's because it, I'm, it, I'm, glad it came out. I'm glad it came out yeah, too because yeah. usually they would make it on another system is what mm-hmm. I'm trying to say that right no it makes more sense but yeah, definitely sure. though, yeah 
on a retro podcast, you're never going to hear me say that that hardware is what makes a difference. Yeah, no, because no, because no, when it comes to a good game, it's not. I mean, because the map in your hand is so cool. Like, even though everybody hates the gamepad, I still it. think with a passion, I they still think it put still that on has the moments screen. that are so neat. You know, let, let me mention that real quick. Because sorry, I am what are we talking about the the the, the tablet gamepad? controller and the okay. mapping on there on a retro podcast? Okay, go for it. Go for it. Um, well, we're talking about Xenoblade. Screw it. I'm going to go. That's true. Go for it. Um, I don't understand it because I am all about simple things. I, that's why I play lots of older games because I like here are my buttons. Here's my stuff. Knows there's no touch screen. There's no BS. I don't have to yell at the screen to make it work like in Skyrim on the Xbox 360. That would just I play that for a whole five minutes with that. <laughs> it didn't like, work. Oh right? Did the best five minutes of gaming <laughs> history God. ever. Yeah. I am all for gimmicks as long as they are not required. The Wii has always bothered me because you are required to have the touchpad. Mm -hmm. You can't buy it without it. Nintendo uh, back in the 80s made dozens of gimmicks. They made power gloves. They made uh, the super scope. They made all these kind of things. And you weren't required to have any of it to play 99% of the games out there. With the Wii U, it's like they are forcing developers, you have to make something work with this touchpad because no one wants to use it. Take a hint. Um, you could very easily release the Wii U without a touchpad with the Pro Controller for cheaper and have it work with 90% of the games out there. Just take the gimmicks off. For Xenoblade, you have quick travel. You have map on the tablet. Oh, I hit the start button and it's right there on the screen. Thank God for that wonderful innovation and magical stuff. I'm not saying get rid of it. I'm just saying it should not be there for me to have to use it and to have to plug in my tablet controller to play for more than two hours at once for it to die. I'm just, I'm just saying, man. I, like I opened options. up Pandora's box. I hear you. I like options. Yeah, you did. We can have that argument on another podcast. Sure. I, I think it makes that sense. I mean, there I get are it. a lot of games that you can totally just throw the gamepad away and use a controller. There's tons of games like that. Right. I think that there are there are examples of it being overused. There are so, there are also examples where I would not want to play this game without it, like Mario Maker. And that's one of the few yeah. where I'd agree with you. Yeah. Yes. So you used it very well. So I totally see your point, but. Um, we're going to move on now. <laughs> so, I'm fine with it. There, there will be a war waged at a later date, and I'm fine with that. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> but while we were talking about Xenoblade, that, that so was that'd be a part. path of broken paths. That wow. is mainly, that's our that's our Xenoblade podcast. Um, uh, we have a little bit of listener mail. We had uh, Elizabeth Silvas email us about an experience she had um, related to Sonic the Hedgehog I want to talk about for a second. Um, she writes... I've enjoyed visiting your booth for a few years, and I was hoping I could share this article with you. It's my brain tumor survival story. It's now playing, uh, sorry. It's how playing the Sonic games helped me with recovery after the surgery. Sonic also helped me deal with the bullies I was dealing with. So her, the article is really interesting. Um, I think we're going to get it on our social network channels on Game Over Video Games. Post it when we post the podcast, Paul, yeah. Yeah. Um, but she basically ha she had a brain tumor when she was a kid that caused her to have a lot of um, uh, um, mechanical like hand issues she couldn't her motor skills weren't up to snuff and so she made got made fun of a lot and her self esteem really came from, came from playing video games and Sonic the Hedgehog was one of them so hopefully we can get an interview with her here on the podcast that's awesome yeah. soonish yeah. that'd be cool points for Sonic being awesome yeah, yeah. awesome um, yeah, so that is our podcast. The next episode, uh, next month, we're going to be talking about Star Fox. Maybe. What's that? Probably. What's Star Fox? Something yeah, about doing an aileron roll, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, so we're going to do, do um, we're going to do part one for Star Fox, which is going to be the SNES game and the Nintendo 64 game mm. uh, in honor of the release of yeah. Star Fox Zero for the Wii U. I really hope it's good. <laughs> I am full. Yeah, I'm really excited for it. Guess what, guys? You got to use that touchpad again. <laughs> Yay. Love you. Maybe this will be the one that will win you over. Hey. Maybe and this is the time. If, if it wasn't Mario Maker, I don't think it's going to happen with Matt. You I, know the only play, touchpad um, that would win me over? Uh, hmm. Sorry, the Toad game. Why can't I remember? Captain Toad? Captain Toad uses it really well. I don't like puzzle games that much. Oh, my God. If, it, if there's no giant robots in it, I was gonna say if, if there is a game that lets me um, I love Captain that lets me have like that game. and they actually had it as a tech demo um, where the main screen it was two giant robots fighting each other and the touchpad was the cockpit view done. They All were, is forgiving, but guess no, what? They are You're making, never, and even if they make they it, it's going to be over here in this country. So they no. were making it. Okay. It was one of the games. That hey they, guys, hey guys, she shut up, shut up. <laughs> I don't want to talk about this anymore. Robots. I'm talking. You got me stuck me into the robot. All right. If you have something to say to us, you can email us at podcast at gameovervideogames.com. You can check out our website, gameovervideogames.com. You can check us out on Twitter at Game 
over games because game over video games is too long to have a Twitter handle of, which is weird. Uh, on Facebook, we are facebook.com slash game over video games. On YouTube, we are youtube.com slash game over video games. There's a pattern here. And um, uh, I wanted to let you guys know that uh, the Game Over Video Games crew is going to be all over the country this year attending various game conventions, comic cons, cool events. If you see our booth, come give us a high five. We'd love to chat with you guys. Let us know how you like the show. Um, Tell us who your favorite giant robot was. I knew he was going to see something about robots. Every time. Always with the giant robots. I got you guys covered. You know what? About it. You know what? Uh, one of the Star Fox games does have robots in it. Right, well, yeah, they do. Which, you know, they're acceptable because of that. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, you guys, for listening. I uh, appreciate you. And, um, yeah, so check we us. We appreciate you, too. Yeah. Uh, this is a monthly podcast where we talk about retro games. And if you like retro games, we're glad you listen. So, cool. Uh, thanks for listening, anyways. See you all next time. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>《Vegas Retro Gaming Convention in Texas》is back with all new tournaments, live events, and special guests, plus tons of retro games and awesome video game merch. With over 6,000 attendees, last year was a little bit cramped. Well, in 2016, we've got over 45,000 square feet. That's over twice the floor space of last year. So stretch your legs and get some breathing room July 30th through 31st at the Palmer Event Center in Austin, Texas. Check out more info at ClassicGameFest.com.